Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Nara Milanish. I am the director of CEMECA, the Center for Mexico and Central America at uh, the Institute for Latin American Studies at Columbia University. Um, quick technical uh, pieces of information. This event is bilingual. You can go Go to the bottom of your screen, choose in the interpretation icon, and select whether you would prefer to listen in Spanish or English. I'd like to thank Carmen Otero de Pires, who is our um, translator today. Um, it, when you select your preferred language at the bottom of the Zoom screen, please mute your main audio and you will hear better. Um, as usual, even two years into the pandemic, Zoom is both a miracle and a mystery. Um, if you cannot hear us at some point as we switch back and forth between languages, please let us know in whatever way you wish to in the chat, etc. cetera, um, and we will try and adjust our audio. Um, a reminder that this event will be recorded. Um, and so if you wish to watch it again on Sunday afternoon, because you have nothing to do, uh, it will be available on the Semeca website. Um, we'll be putting uh, information about Semeca in the chat momentarily um, with our um, social media and other contact information. Um, and now I would like to, um, in addition to um, inviting you all to join the center's um, activities, welcome you um, warmly to this event. It is such a pleasure um, to get to introduce this panel, a star-studded panel of fantastic scholars whose work I personally have read um, for more than 20 years um, or more in some cases probably. Um, but I'd like to introduce um, the host or hostess of this panel, um, Professor Marisa Ruiz Trejo, who is a feminist anthropologist from Chiapas, Mexico, and a full-time professor at the Autonomous University of Chiapas. Um, so I want to introduce Marisa uh, very briefly, and then I will pass the rectangle to her. So uh, Professor Ruiz Trejo holds a PhD in Anthropology and Latin American Studies from the Autonomous University of Madrid. She's currently um, here in New York City with us as an Edmundo O'Gorman Fellow at the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University. Professor Ruiz Trejo has been a visiting scholar at New York University and the University of California, Berkeley in 2016. She participated in historical anthropological work in the Sepulsarco case in Guatemala, the most significant uh, legal victory against sexual violence, violence committed by the army during the genocide. Um, she is also an activist with the collective Pluriversidades Feministas. Luis Trejo recently published Decolonize and Depatriarchalize, a word I cannot say, uh, the social sciences, Memory and Life in Chiapas, Central America and the Caribbean. And she is also uh, the co-editor of a volume, which of course is the topic of our panel today, uh, Feminist Anthropologies in Mexico, Epistemologies, Ethics, Practices and Diverse Views, co-edited of course with a number of colleagues, several of whom uh, you will hear from today. So I would like to just thank Marisa um, with very uh, warmly and with great gratitude and cariño um, for her stay um, this past month and a half in, here in New York with us. Um, she has been an indefatigable organizer of um, activities and has brought um, wonderful energy to ILAS and to its um, many um, constituents. So I just wanna personally thank her for all of her work um, and energy that she's brought to us, not to mention her mole. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass the rectangle um, to Professor Ruiz Trejo, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Nara, for being here and for your generosity with me in this event and in other events that uh, someone said that cannot hear me. Uh, maybe you need to activate the two options that Anna and, and Nara said in into Spanish or in English. Uh, if you are joining us in Zoom, there is a, a translation. So uh, I hope uh, this will work. 
So uh, welcome to everybody to this activity. I am delighted to introduce some of the participants of this round table on the book, Feminist Anthropologies in Mexico, Epistemologies, Ethics, Practices, and Diverse Looks, written in Spanish and co-edited by Lina Rosa Berrio, uh, Patricia Marisa, Castaneda. So I think yes. a lot of uh, lines coming from the headphones. Do you think you can um, unplug your headphones? People are having okay. trouble listening to you. Okay, is it better like that? Yes. Yes. You could. Tell okay, I I am very sorry. I I was saying that uh, this book was co-edited by Lina Rosa Berrio, Patricia Castañeda, Mary Goldsmith, Montserrat Salas, Laura Valladolid. No te escuchamos, Marisa. En mí. Okay, um, Anna, there, it seems like there is a problem and, and some of the participants cannot hear me. Did you activate no, if you are in I, Zoom? No, yeah. I, I'm able to hear you, but I don't understand why other people are not able to hear me. Las que no escuchan eh, están, eligieron eh, la opción en español, o sea, se siente en inglés, pero a lo mejor en, en, en español no se siente, o si se escu o escuchan los de en español también. Ni en español ni en inglés. Hmm. Ok, ok. No. Ok, maybe I will activate the option of interpreter. Let's see I, if it works. I, no, I, I can... I'm going to try to... Make your uh, co host and see if that works. Okay, Marisa, can you? Okay, can you hear me now? No, no one. Okay. Professor Milanish, are you able to listen to Marisa? Yes, it seems like. I believe that. Uh, if you click on translation, uh, interpretation, sorry, and you click off, then you will be able to hear Marisa. Don't click on English, just click on off if you wanna hear Marisa in English. Okay, can I continue? Okay, let's, can you hear, can everybody hear Marisa now? Just give me a- five. Marisa, habla. Hola. <laughs> I am here, Carmen. Can you hear me? Carmen? Yes. Yeah. It seems like Carmen that is trans. Seems like everyone is able to hear you. Carmen. No, Carmen, no, Carmen cannot me? hear me. And this is a problem because she is the person who will translate. Um, okay, let me check this very quickly with uh, Okay. You know, Marisa, I think it's best if you continue with the event and we'll, we'll, we'll work it out with Carmen so we don't okay. run out of okay. Yeah. okay. Okay, that's, that's um, the things that sometimes happen. And uh, if you want, I will continue. Uh, I was saying that um, this book that we will present today is a collective effort that embodies a powerful conversation uh, between anthropologists from various institutions, regions, and generations. And today, in this round table, we will have discussions about some of the contents of the book. For example, the epistemological models that emerged in the 80s and methodological approaches uh, such as collaborative dialogues, personal trajectories, and issues approached from a feminist perspective. And with these discussions, we would like to highlight the persistence of patriarchal culture and structural violence that harms women's rights and other diverse subjects. And in addition, we will discuss, for example, the different expressions of agency, political activism, 
civil society organizations, indigenous, Afro-descendant, peasant, and LGBT and women's movements, among other topics. Uh, today we will have a wonderful round table with feminist anthropologists from Mexico and from the US. And I think that the dialogue will be very rich. Now I will mention very quickly all the participants of this round table and then when their turn comes, I will do a quick intro of each one of them. The round table will be divided into parts. First, we will listen to the guest speakers and after some of the authors of the book. And the, the guest speakers are Lourdes Arispe, Corinda Maldonado Gotti, Susan Hanchet, and Brigitte French. And thank you very much for being here and welcome to this space. And on the other hand, the editors and authors of the book that are participating in this round table are Mary Goldsmith and Montserrat Salas and me, Marisa Ristrejo. And for those who have joined to Zoom, uh, you may have already noticed, I hope that, that this is working, that this event is being translated to Spanish. I am not sure if we are having this translation, but I uh, want to thank Carmen Otero that is doing this great uh, contribution to this event. And um, it is a great honor for me to start with Lourdes Arispe, a pioneering woman in anthropology of women in Mexico. Lourdes Arispe got a PhD in ethnology from the London School of Economics and Political Science. In Mexico, she pioneered studies of indigenous peoples, migration, rural women, social development, and culture. And she received both a Fulbright and a John Guggenheim grant to study culture in India and in Bangladesh. Uh, she has a, an enormous trajectory in different anthropological associations. And her latest publication in English are Culture, Diversity, and Heritage, Major Studies. And uh, I am very glad that she accepted uh, to be here. Thank you very much, uh, Lourdes, and, and, and go ahead. Thank you. Hey, Marisa, before you continue, I just want to make a quick uh, uh, announcement. For those of you who need to listen to the, para los que necesitan escuchar esto en español, ustedes solo tienen que buscar la traducción en español. Pero para los que quieren escucharla en inglés, también tienen que ir al, a la opción de traducción y activar el botón en off para que puedan escuchar a Marisa. No lo pongan en inglés. For those of you who speak English, you don't need, you need to go to the translation menu, but you don't need to select this, the English option. You just have to select the off option, and then you'll be able to listen to Marisa. Thank you, Anna. So is that working for everyone? Can you say a few words, Marisa, so we make sure that everyone who wants to listen to the audio in English listens to you? Lourdes, you're muted. All right. Um, I wanted to ask you how many minutes do I have? Uh, between uh, five and ten. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, voy a hablar en español porque el libro está en español y eh, no entendí muy bien esto de la traducción y tantos botones, pero espero que me puedan escuchar. Bien. Me da muchísimo gusto estar con ustedes, jóvenes de muchas generaciones que estamos en el mismo camino desde hace mucho tiempo. Eh, les agradezco mucho la invitación porque este libro de Antropologías Feministas es muy importante. Es un libro que eh, una publicación vital para sostener 
y comparar las estrategias actuales y hacia el futuro en el campo de la antropología feminista. Es un recuento de más de 40 años de investigación, de proyectos, movimientos, disidencias teóricas y políticas y narrativas en la coproducción de un conocimiento que en la actualidad se vuelve cada vez más urgente en tiempos del feminicidio, en tiempos del cambio climático y del antropoceno. Felicito muy sinceramente a todas las investigadores y investigadoras, la mayoría de las cuales desde hace 40 años y más han estado en esta lucha. Las felicito. Y las felicito por mostrar que el campo de la antropología feminista se constituye ya como uno de los campos importantes de reflexión hacia el futuro. Bien, voy a comentar el artículo La dominación estructural en la construcción de rebeldías de nuestros feminismos y de nuestras alianzas de Mercedes Olivera. Es un magnífico título. Nuestras rebeldías, feminismo y nuestras alianzas. Eh, en este capítulo, Mercedes Olivera muestra su labor de más de 50 años para apoyar a las campesinas y a las mujeres campesinas e indígenas en varios países y sobre todo en China. Y me, me da un, una emoción especial hablar de Mercedes, porque fui mi maestra en, eh, en la Escuela Nacional de Antropología e Historia, nos dio un curso y después desapareció. Y preguntábamos, ¿va a regresar a dar clases?, hasta que un amigo me dijo, Lourdes, ya no presentes. Está en una lucha y va a regresar. Y en efecto, regresó en los noventas después del de surgimiento del movimiento zapatista y ya era comandante del movimiento. Eh, y yo entiendo, déjenme decirles muy rápidamente quién soy, Entiendo la lucha que ella emprendió, porque justamente de 90 a 93 en la selva de la Candona yo dirigí un proyecto de investigación sobre la desforestación social en la selva de la Candona. Tenía yo 10 estudiantes trabajando en el proyecto y cada semana nos venían a visitar alrededor de 8 o 10 personas a averiguar qué estábamos haciendo. Era un momento muy delicado en términos de política de la frontera y política de cuidado de la selva. Y ahí, déjenme decirles, había muchas señales del surgimiento de este gran movimiento, del movimiento zapatista, que era incipiente, y que en el libro que escribí muy rápidamente decidí velar, porque no era el momento de hacer esto público, y el tema del, del libro este, que me estaban financiando era la desforestación y yo quería analizar las percepciones sociales de la desforestación. Esto para decirles que entiendo la fuerza y la valentía de Mercedes Olivera durante tantos años frente a tantos obstáculos y que haya logrado no solo eso, sino consolidar estos movimientos. Entonces, nos dice eh, eh, Mercedes que en Chiapas el problema ha sido que la reforma agraria nunca se hizo. Pero lo es, hay un dato que es muy importante relevar, que es que en Chiapas los peones acasillados fueron liderados por los dueños de las haciendas en contra del ejército revolucionario de Venustiano Carranza y por eso no entró al crisol de los cambios revolucionarios en México y por eso sigue siendo una estructura muy colonial como bien lo describe Mercedes y muchas otras de ustedes que trabajan en Chiapas eh, por cierto Marisa te felicito por tu excelente trabajo en Chiapas eh, describe la situación terrible de los indígenas y sobre todo de las mujeres indígenas en Chiapas pero hace un un recuento muy interesante de las experiencias de dos grupos de mujeres indígenas en Chiapas, la Coordinadora Diocesana de Mujeres y el Centro de Derechos de la Mujer en Chiapas, 
pero ella siempre participó muy activamente en las bases de apoyo zapatistas, que señala que son miles aproximadamente y que son mujeres organizadas, indígenas sobre todo en los cinco caracoles autónomos. Describe entonces eh, la situación que prevalecía en Chiapas, cómo fueron organizándose estos tres movimientos y eh, al final ese, y hace un análisis que me pareció muy interesante porque eh, hubo todo un movimiento de convergencia de estos tres movimientos que obviamente tenían orígenes distintos, pero se unieron en relación a, varios, a varias temáticas. Y esto lo analizaron en muchas reuniones que tuvieron, porque lo interesante de este libro de Antropologías Feministas es que muestra el desarrollo de los estudios de antropología feminista, pero también releva las disidencias, los conflictos, los puntos metodológicos de la investigación antropológica que había que resolver para poder avanzar hacia el futuro. Y entonces, déjenme nada más hacer, eh, hablarles del excelente análisis que, eh, que hicieron estas tres organizaciones de mujeres en donde el, el punto de partida de su reflexión era siempre pensando en servir a los demás, servir a los otros, servir a los miembros de la familia y de la comunidad. Quiero decirles que desde mi perspectiva muy personal, la palabra servir me causa un poco de problema. Pero en fin, esta es la, la propuesta que hacían las tres organizaciones para hablar, uno, de la colectividad, y sabemos que esto es especialmente importante para las mujeres indígenas, de la intersubjetividad, como ahora se entiende la relación entre hombres y mujeres, relaciones de género, relaciones entre las propias mujeres indígenas, afrodescendientes, etc. La complementaridad en la igualdad, que este es un punto muy nuevo, muy novedoso, que tenemos que seguir analizando. Y el sentido humano, el sentido humano de todo movimiento de las mujeres. Como se me está yendo muy rápido el tiempo, quiero eh, decirles simplemente que Mercedes, como conclusión, eh, ella misma pregunta, ¿por qué a pesar de que podemos compartir y de que podemos eh, organizar las tres organizaciones, queda en pie la pregunta, ¿por qué no nos unimos para luchar conjuntamente contra el sistema de opresiones? Y lo que yo hubiera querido es que explicara cómo se reconocen y eliminan las dependencias y sobre todo las fuentes de esta dominación tanto colonial como eh, la dominación Hacia las, hacia las mujeres. Eh, y, y ya simplemente para terminar, quiero señalar este, que yo pienso que el movimiento de las mujeres surge, tiene dos orígenes muy distintos. Uno es un movimiento ideológico que eh, surgió en muchas culturas, muchas civilizaciones, desde los griegos, y es un movimiento de defensa y avance de las mujeres pero está basado en el propio deseo de las mujeres de avanzar. Hay un segundo movimiento que fue el, en el que yo me hice feminista porque lo empecé a investigar en los setentas, en el sentido de que hay tres procesos irreversibles que hace que las mujeres estén cambiando su papel en todas las sociedades. El primero es la transición demográfica, en donde el papel de las mujeres ya ha cambiado. El segundo es la píldora anticonceptiva y luego la cascada de descubrimientos sobre reproducción y sobre eh, cuestiones genéticas y cognitivas. Estos son irreversibles. Eso es lo que ha abierto la posibilidad de un nuevo camino para las mujeres. Esto hay que señalarlo porque... Los detractores del feminismo siempre dicen, ah, es un problema ideológico de estas mujeres que les lavaron el cerebro y que no saben lo que están haciendo. No, no es ideológico, es civilizacional, porque hay procesos 
irreversibles que lo están provocando. Y el ter tercer proceso que no es irreversible, pero que en estos momentos domina y de ahí viene la dominación colonial, es el capitalismo que sigue insistiendo en acumular ganancias para unos pocos a costa de la desigualdad, de la destrucción de la naturaleza y de eh, la, la, la extracción de riquezas minerales a través del extractivismo en nuestro mundo actual. Entonces creo que hay que situar el movimiento de las mujeres en estos dos grandes, estas dos grandes líneas. Y entonces preguntarnos, muy bien, este libro demuestra cómo se ha ido hacia adentro en el análisis de lo que les pasa a las mujeres, lo que quieren las mujeres, lo que luchan las mujeres. Pero además de ir hacia adentro, ahora hay que, hay, hay que ir hacia adelante. Y hacia adelante el reto es clarísimo. La extinción o la sobrevivencia. Eh, el antropoceno o la destrucción total de la naturaleza. Y creo que este es el marco que tenemos que cuidar. Bien, pues las felicito nuevamente. Excelente trabajo de todas. Thank you, Lourdes. Thank you very much for your comments on the book. And um, I am sorry because now I need to change to English, but uh, we are trying to do this simultaneous translation. Uh, I would like to know if it is working now and if Carmen can uh, hear me. Okay, perfect. And Nara, do, do you want to give a little comment? No, it's okay. Okay, so uh, now let's continue with Corinda Maldonado that received a PhD from the University of Austin, Texas. In 2012, she is a clinical as assistant professor in anthropology and American Indian studies and the director of the Native American and Indigenous Language Lab at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Her research centers on indigenous social movements and racial formation in Mexico, Guatemala, and within the indigenous diaspora in the United States, and her work is articulated and produced through collaborative and decolonial frameworks. Her research is a result of decades of engagement and collaborative work with indigenous organizations of Puebla, Chiapas, and indigenous and non-indigenous immigrant communities in the U.S. Her latest publication with anthropologist Lourdes Najera is Transnational Settler, settler um, Colonial Formations and Global Capital, a Consideration of Indigenous Mexican Migrants, published in American Quarterly. Thank you, Corinta. Uh, hi, everyone. Hola, eh, todos. Uh, good afternoon. We, I'm in uh, Mexico time, so I'll send, uh, or Midwest time. <laughs> Um, so uh, thank you for inviting me, Marisa. I'm uh, very excited to have the opportunity to engage with this text and the authors, of course. And I chose a couple chapters to talk about today. I, I might just reduce it to one. We'll see how much time do I have? <laughs> the same five to 10 minutes? Yes. Okay, so I will, I will um, try to see where I can get to with this time. Um, and so I'm discussing, uh, well, first, congratulations for this fantastic uh, collection of essays and, and, and this really, it's more than anything, the, a, a long genealogy of works uh, and also a vision uh, looking towards the future. Um, and a very, um, you know, I'm very nostalgic about it in terms that I'm, I'm from Mexico, Mexico and I was formed in Mexico, but ended up over here. And uh, so just reading uh, the text, reading the energy, reading the different uh, dialogues and fluidity of, of those conversations with communities in and out of the academy were definitely very refreshing for me. <laughs> uh, so thank you. So I'm going to start with two, I'm going to comment on two chapters. One, uh, Gisela's chapter, Gisela Espinosa Damián. Uh, her text is Desplazando la Mirada del Resultado del Proceso, Investigación Colaborativa y Coproducción del Conocimiento. 
I guess you could somewhat uh, translate it to um, shifting the gaze from the results to the process, collaborative research, and co-production of knowledge. Um, and the next text, if I have time, it will be, um, can you hear me well? Okay, the next text will, the next text will be uh, Estela Casados, Empatía e Identificación Emocional en Investigaciones Feministas sobre Violencia contra las Mujeres. Um, and just a little kind of side note, uh, I chose them uh, more than anything. I, they were fantastic texts and I wanted to engage with all of them, but those are uh, close to me. Gisela was my professor as well. <laughs> so kind of those trajectories that keep, uh, you know, embracing us as we move forward, uh, as well as Estela Casados was my, um, my cohort. She was part of my cohort. She was my classmate during uh, our master's in rural development in La Guam. Um, so those were those uh, those two persons were critical to my formation in many ways, right? And, and part of my history. So I'll start with uh, Gisela Damian's text, um, and she takes us. I'll just do a kind of a little description and 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 of the text. She takes us um, with her in her journey through her experience doing collaborative research with and alongside indigenous women that had worked as agricultural workers in the San Quintin Valley of Baja California, right? That were work, worked at some point as farm workers um, in Baja California, Mexico, in case you're not familiar, and who in the context of massive mobilizations and political upheaval of agricultural laborers demanding better working conditions, among many other demands, felt the need to reflect, uh, to do a reflection on the mobilization and also to show the working conditions that had brought people to mobilize. It's in that process of, of, of reflection, it's in that process of co-construction of knowledge uh, that she takes us through each step. Um, and just before, one thing that she stresses throughout the, her uh, description and analysis and, and you know, reflective process is that this, uh, this wasn't a pre-designed collaborative research. Uh, it kind of emerges as well as, as, as um, Estela's work emerges out of political processes, uh, social needs, um, and political commitments, right? And those two are very kind of anchors that ground both of those works and that I definitely, uh, you know, connect with them and assume that uh, that position as well uh, within my, my research uh, and, and the complications and, and complexities that that brings about. Um, Gisela, uh, in a way, you know, she had already establish a relationship with this group that she works with in, in El Valle de San Quintín. Again, these are women um, that had already a, a strong mode of organization, had a history together, but also had a history with Gisela, right? So there was already established effective connections and established uh, relationships with the group that allowed for this collaborative, this collaboration and this co-creation to emerge. Um, I love the text personally. I it just resonated on going each page just resonated to the work and the questions I have, to the complexities, to the limitations that we have when doing this type of research, uh, when wanting to push the envelope a little bit more, but we can't do per, due to institutional constraints, but also to institution uh, to uh, constraints in the field and and just 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 the the nature of research itself. Um, she takes it little by little through the process as the title says, right? She's, she's turning the gaze back to the process rather than the results, right? And I find that very rich in that she takes us little by little to, and shows us the thickness, right? Of the, and, and the richness of this where it's not in the results, but rather in the process, right? Even though they are obviously connected and they, they are always uh, um, in, 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 relation, in relationship to each other, uh, it's through that envisioning and, and unveiling that, 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 um, that process that we can learn, right? I haven't found many works. It's, there's not a, a host of works, at least in English and Spanish, um, in relationship uh, that the detail the research process as Gisela did. So that I, for me, I think is very valuable. Uh, we tend to not wanna think about, um, and please do let me know. I don't know what time I started. Now I don't know how much time I have. Let me know. <laughs> it's okay if you want like two minutes more. 
Okay, so she detailed us through, she walks us through different, uh, so the different process, uh, the process of research from coming together, right, and all these effective relationships that needed to be there beforehand, right, also through the, the building a common ground, right, and it's not only a common ground of political, maybe, um, political uh, movements, but also in terms of uh, the common ground in terms of the the concepts, the ideas that we're working through as researchers, right, as collaborators, that those are really hard to, to come through together uh, and to really uh, concrete, concretize uh, collectively, right? We all have different knowledges and different modes of understanding concept ideas, uh, what are, even what an interview means, right? Even those, those little aspects of it become very, uh, process that take a long time, right? So she shows us the coming together, the elaboration of the questions that she did with, the, with, the, with this group of women, their perspectives, their particular contours that, that this woman brought to the table as they talked through it, right? So really thinking through the thickness of, of those collaborative uh, knowledge productions that came about. Uh, there's an example that I love in terms of how you know, the intersectional frame didn't come about. Uh, didn't, I did not bring the intersectional frame per se, um, but rather it emerged organically, right? As we were talking, we agreed on certain types of, of, of um, uh, concepts that we wanted to, to think through as, as researchers, as a collective of researchers. However, uh, this woman kept bringing in other, other uh, ideas that made the, the, the research uh, even uh, richer, right? Like including men as, as also part of the struggle, right? Uh, the NS as part of this, uh, as part of uh, a group that also was suffering particular violences in the labor, uh, in the agricultural fields. Also generations, right? She brings this idea, these women bring this, they want to include all the different generations, right? So all these different voices and all these different groups that these women were bringing to the fore that they thought would enrich and make, make the, the process of, uh, of knowledge production much richer. Um, she talks about the learning of the research tools, the learnings in and out of a structured interview, unstructured interviews with the women, uh, but also learning the technological hoops of that comes with it, right? Of learning how to, you know, <laughs> uh, make sure that the, the, the grabadora, sorry if I'm going from Spanglish and English, the recorder is on, right? Uh, and that is working properly. Uh, all those things take time. And this takes me to some of the things that she brings to the fore towards the end, right? One is the way she mobilizes um, different uh, feminist from frameworks and she thinks about them as blueprints, right? They're not formulas, they're blueprints that allow us to think through and around them, between them, to look at these processes, right? Uh, to think about coming together, to think about making common ground within our differences. Um, the other one that I, because I know I have very little time and I'm gonna have to run through it, is thinking through all the institutional um, infrastructure that we need still to build, right? One of her questions that she brings to the fore is what do we understand as collaborative research? What, are, what, are, what, what does it include and what doesn't include? Is it just bringing people in that work? We're just shifting from collaborator, from informant to collaborator and still have the same kind of role? Or does it really mean something else, right? And these are the things that we need to talk about. And these are the things that we need to bring to the classroom as she argues. Um, so we can then uh, use those uh, feminist frameworks to create, uh, you know, decolonize knowledge production to think about all these processes by which we keep at times uh, repeating, right, certain um, logics, right, that are already institutionalized and that we, the, the constraints are very much so through the institutions, right? So how do we think about this collaboration and this co-construction of knowledge with institutional um, you know, the institutional realm. And that's it for me was the question is like, is it possible even or not, right? And I'm thinking from here, from this side of the border uh, and also knowing the other side, uh, the South, more as uh, Mexico, but more as a student. Uh, but for me, it was this, this uh, I, I tend to think, and this may be just my nostalgia, and I tend to uh, think of a lot more fluidity between 
um, the ins and outs of the academy, right? It can be obviously think through imperial formations, uh, uh, institutionalizations, academies, uh, la academización, <laughs> uh, also, right, of, of all our work. And so, how would that look when we're trying to think through this, this concepts, through these processes, this research process, these methodologies? Do they work? Uh, in the context of institutionalization, or would they completely uh, be something that we have to just not even uh, go there? Right? So that's a question that I bring to the table, and that I really, uh, you know, uh, that really uh, resonated with uh, Isela's work in terms of really drawing to us the failures and possibilities of collaborative and co-construction of knowledge. Um, in her example of San Quintin, I don't know if I'm done with my time. Yes, I think that. Uh, okay. If you want, we can continue in the in the last part of the comments. Okay. But maybe like uh, the last idea to to finish. Do you want to? to no, just one? just uh, I'll, I can leave it for the questions and the conversation we have later, so everybody can talk. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, um, uh, Corinta, for for your thoughts and and for also for sharing your your feelings. Uh, on the book and I think that it is very important to to have these debates across the the borders and and I am very happy uh, to have this opportunity to 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 meet you and to know more about your work and now we will listen uh, to Susan Hanchek. Uh, Susan Hanchek uh, holds a PhD in anthropology at Columbia University uh, here in New York and a BA in sociology and anthropology at Brit College uh, in Portland, Oregon. And she's the co-founder of Planning Alternatives for, for Change, a company dedicated to holistic problem solving and people-centered development. She does social research and analysis, planning and program evaluation, organizational development, training, writing, and editing. And her areas of expertise are social development, community organization, water, sanitization, gender and development, public health, women's health, between other topics. She has a very interesting experience in applied anthropology, and that's why I am very glad that she accepted this invitation because um, we think that feminist anthropologists are working in different areas of the society and not only at the universities. And uh, the work of Susan, it is a good example of this. And thank you very much, Susan, for being here. Thank you, Marissa, for inviting me. Um, I was able, I'm not a, a fluent speaker of Spanish or reader, so I used Google Translate to read 11 chapters of this book. <laughs> and um, it, they weren't perfect English, but I'm, I was very, very happy that, to have that opportunity. Um, the people whose chapters I read were Patricia Castaneda, Maurice, Marissa Ruiz, Gisela, Mary Goldsmith, Mercedes Oliveira, Laura Valladeres, Carmen, Carmela Cariño, Gilda Salazar, and Cristina Omotien, plus the introduction and conclusion. Um, these are wonderful uh, uh, papers, all of them, and I, I, I'm going to discuss two of them in the course of my um, presentation. Marissa has asked me to make some general remarks, but my my, my own background is at quite a distance from your, your project. <laughs> um, you do set, emphasize what you call situated knowledge, so I'm going to tell you a few things about where I'm coming from. Um, my work outside the US has been mostly in Southern Asia and in India and Bangladesh, and not in Latin America. I've never done research in Latin America, but I am a feminist. I'm an anthropologist for a 1970 PhD. Early in my career, I participated actively in our New York consciousness raising group, the Ruth Benedict Collective. And at that same time in the early 70s, we formed the International Women's Anthropology Conference. So this is a, there was a lot going on there and I, I've 
um, many of the people that I was working with at that time, a fellow young professors, we have gone on and done some of the work that's cited in your bibliographies. But um, after about 10 years of teaching, I left academia and I started working as an applied or practicing anthropologist. What we call practicing anthropologist means you're not necessarily hired as an anthropologist, you're just hired. And I was writing grants and doing program planning for uh, women's health, community development, um, various things in New York City. I worked in the mayor's office as a coordinator for a program on adolescent pregnancy and so on. I did that for about 12 years. <clears throat> then I started working overseas again in Bangladesh, and I've been working mostly in Bangladesh for the last 25 years. Um, I want to say something about this, uh, this field of applied anthropology, because it does connect directly to a lot of what you're talking to, but there is some translation required. Um, the so-called women in development has been a major focus of international development programs since uh, Esther Basra published her great book, Women's Role in Economic Development. Some of you may be familiar with that. It was about how women weren't benefiting from most development programs. And it really woke up the international world. And ever since then, um, there have been women's focus involving women, encouraging women to participate and benefit from whatever happens in aid programs. It's been a very major part of the aid system since the uh, 1980s. <clears throat> so I was, I've been hired as a gender specialist, meaning women's specialist uh, on several projects relating to water and all sorts of other subjects. And, and also, um, I've encountered quite a lot of obstacles in doing these assignments. And I'll say something about the world of the aid world, but um, I've also met a lot of interesting and, and, and smart people along the way, and become good friends with some of them. I've closely analyzed the work of many aid organizations, working especially with UNICEF, World Health Organization, CARE, Water Aid, and the World Bank. And I did some with the Asian Development Bank too, while doing what we call evaluation studies. These are assessments of whether programs are actually working or not, but specific projects or programs. And some things, uh, uh, and many of the projects I analyzed were successful, helping to build social equity and empower women. And some made mistakes and wasted a lot of money. They, they didn't always love me when I finished these evaluation studies, I'll tell you that. Um, Multilateral and bilateral aid donors and big NGOs do control large resources and they make large decisions that influence many people. There are power differences within and between organizations, plenty of what you would call hegemony. There are dominant guys who'd rather boss people around and look good rather than do anything to promote social justice or women's equality. I found plenty of those in academia too. I mean, it's not, I'm there everywhere. Um, but there are plenty of good people too. Um, Gisela Espinosa Damion's paper on collaborative research helped me to bridge the language gaps between the academic theory and the international development world. Um, what she I, I was very I was struck by what she called collaboration and the co-production of knowledge and bringing in um, what would usually be called informants or the people you meet in the field bringing them in and making them co-producers of knowledge. Um, in the development area, community development and social development, we call this participation. And it's really pretty much the same thing, listening to people, supporting their efforts to define and achieve their own goals. And it's been a core principle of, for example, uh, it goes back quite a ways in the United States to what was, what was once called the war on poverty. I, my first work in New York was at the end of what we call the war on poverty. I was working in community development and women's health and people's participation is a very big part of this whole idea, which has now been completely abandoned with neoliberalism in the United States. Um, and uh, NGOs and many other organizations in the international world a participatory rural appraisal is a, is a standard word used to 
really go out and just see what people want and listen to them and pay attention to them. Anthropology is an absolutely perfect training for this. Um, some of my jobs I've found that uh, has been to bring people's voices to policymakers to go in and say, well, here's what's really happening out there. Just in case you didn't know how your program is working out on the ground, here's what's happening. This isn't always welcome. Um, one of my colleagues brought two actual peasant women to a conference on water management. And she was very much criticized, even though involving women in water management is supposed to be a goal of the project. So people thought that was ridiculous. Why are these actual women being brought here? And I'm glad she did, but this is the sort of pushback you get and you need people at all levels to support direct involvement, engagement, get the voices of regular folks up into the decision-making sphere. Um, I wanna point out that knowledge creation can be a part of this type of applied or practicing career. I publish articles about what we've learned from our program evaluation studies and other development activities. I spent some time at UNICEF in 2015, um, instructing senior managers on how to use qualitative methods in program planning and assessments. And it really took hold, they do like it. I give waters, I give papers at conferences on water and sanitation. And I also do go to anthropology conferences. Um, the UN has been a big part of my life for the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, in, in the 19, I went to the 1995 Fourth World Conference on Women in China. And I, ever since then, I've been going annually to the Commission on Status of Women meetings and listening to the conversations of the people who come. People come from all over. It's a very welcoming space. It's, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, communication and some very amazing combinations of people uh, show up at the UN on, in March every year. Um, and for the last five years, I've been the co-director of IWAC. Uh, Patricia Castaneda, you guys have a lot of names. I'm hoping I'm saying the right ones. Patricia Castaneda has a good discussion of applied anthropology in her, her paper on contributions from feminist anthropology. She correctly mentions that the languages and the categories of non-academic anthropologists are different from those who teach and do scholarly research. Um, the things I've mentioned like program evaluation and participatory rural appraisal, these aren't necessarily in the anthropology scholars vocabulary, but um, I think you could introduce them to your students in part, as part of your teaching activity. I think it would be helpful to them and might help to bridge some gaps. A uh, very important point that she makes is the interdisciplinary nature of applied work. Um, uh, when you go and do these jobs, you're not alone. You're always part of the team. For example, my work on water resources has, I've, has brought me into close connection with engineers. And I really had to learn how to talk to them. <laughs> they don't want to hear about, you know, abstraction. They want, they want practical conversations. I've had lots of fights, for example, about the concepts of hot and cold and uh, health, the health ideas. And the, to try to say, explain, it's not really about heat and it's not really about temperature, things like that. We've had lots of these kind of conversations, but you have to get really good at translating and explaining your point of view um, in order to deal with these interdisciplinary um, situations. Um, people who work in health turn to talk to doctors. I can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is to learn how to talk to people who, you need your answer theory, but you have to translate into language that everyone can understand. She also talks about what she calls the investigación a la carta, you know, a la carte research is what Google calls it. Um, and I have worked a lot as a consultant which means that you're addressing specific problems. You're not going out to do um, everything. You're out, you're out there to answer some questions. And we have actually gathered a lot of information alongside my team and I, 
and we, we, we actually wrote a book about how people think about water. Um, so, you know, you can do this, but it isn't actually your task. Your task is to answer questions like, do they understand how to get arsenic out of drinking water? Um, are they doing such and such a thing? Or do they really grasp the idea that toilets are good for public health? Things like that, very specific focus questions. Okay, I wanna say that um, there are a lot of very uh, smart and capable people working in social development projects locally, worldwide, at any level. Your own government, you know, regional NGOs, donor organizations, the UN, they're all over the place. And like, I, I have colleagues who've worked in Amnesty International, the US Park Service, UN Women, Save the Children, all anthropologists, people with at least a master's degree. And they, they're doing a lot of important things. And I can see from the chapters in, your, in this book that you also are applying your knowledge. And as, but I wanna urge you as professors to help your students get out into this world that you know, there aren't enough academic jobs for them to all become professors and clones. You have to help them, guide them into these new directions. And that's where I'm, I'm wanted, that's why I wanted to present this idea to you um, that, that you, know, you, you, can, you can get them out there. There's a lot of things for them to do. Problem is that in the United States, at least, a lot of professors never have done any of these things. So there's a there's a gap, and I'm, I'm I consider it a kind of unfortunate gap between academia and the applied world. I, I wish it were closer than it is, and I know that it's a lot closer in some countries than in than it is in the U.S. Um, one other general comment I want to make is. Um, the foundational concepts and research methods of social or cultural anthropology are very, very useful for this kind of work. I've done basic ethnographic research and it was excellent training for this kind of thing. I think I learned, I learned a lot in, in working in New York too, to about analysis of organizations and how they work. In, in uh, ethnographic work, I did more kinship stuff and rituals and myths and things. I'm, but I'm, I'm a little disturbed and puzzled by how many of the, these articles in your book talk about anthropology as androcentric and colonial. Yeah, sure, there's been that, but, um, and, I, and I think it's different than the meanings of colonial colonialization of anthropology are very special in Mexico because of your own history. They have a different meaning than they might have here. But um, I, I feel that uh, we all have the power to actually define what anthropology is. Um, my first anthro professor, Dave French said, anthropology is what anthropologists do. And I, I really, that, that idea came to me is that it's not out of our power to say what anthropology is or what, it, you know, we are anthropology. And so that's um, my concluding comment. And I very much congratulate all of you. I have a lot of thoughts about the many articles I read that we can have that discussion some other time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susan, and uh, for your comments and for this big effort to translate <laughs> in the chapters and I would like embarrassing. To, yes, that's, that's incredible. And I would like to thank you also for your time because uh, during this stay in Colombia, uh, we have having conversations and it was very rich for me to have uh, those discussions uh, with you. And I think that it is very interesting for us to receive different uh, readings of the chapters of the book. Uh, because when you talk about your experience, I can see that the work of feminist anthropologists can have an important dialogue, not only with people in academia, not only between anthropologists, professors, and students, but people in social organizations and with policy makers, with people in different fields of society. And thank you very much for that. And now it is the turn of Bridget Jean uh, French. Uh, she's assistant vice president 
of Global Education and Professor of Anthropology at Grinnell College. She is the author of three books, including Maya Ethnolinguistic Identity, Violence, Cultural Rights and Modernity in Highlight, Highland Guatemala, and Anthropological Lives with Virginia Dominguez. And her work on feminicide has appeared in Miss Magazine and Salon.com. She is currently writing a book on Maya genocide survivor testimony in Guatemala in research collaboration with Maya colleagues. Uh, we will have uh, between five and 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Bridget. Marisa, thank you very much. Um, Buenas tardes a todos y todas. Thank you um, very much for the invitation to have a moment to join you all. It's really uh, a great honor to be uh, virtually among such prolific uh, feminist scholars um, and, and to have the chance to discuss a little bit this book, which I am certain will become a, a foundational text in the next decade, both for anthropology and for feminist studies. Um, and that way I imagine the text joining Marisa, what you have done in your chapter of outlining intergenerational genealogies and trajectories. I understand this book to be uh, a moment in that broader picture. And I think that foreshadows where I hope to focus my comments, my brief comments around the futuricity of, of the work that you all have given us. So, um, in other words, where do we go? What, where have you suggested that we go? What are we to follow? Um, so if we, are to, if we are to follow, as it were, queer feminist scholars like Lauren Berlant and Sarah Ahmed, we understand that affect always matters. And from a distance, um, from, the, from my distance, it's clear that this project is is a, is a labor of love. It's a product of deeply felt passions, commitments um, mm -hmm. that are intellectual, political, and, and affective, right? That resonates with the text greatly. So I think the text is a gift and it also from that position offers, uh, offers us all a great challenge, an impassioned challenge um, of how we are, how are we to engage with the epistemologies, the inquiries, and the arguments that you that you all give us, and I would say um, there's a diversity of answers, but I I hear them coming together in particular ways. So um, I'll give you. Uh, I just want to go over broadly some of the answers that I heard that that to me felt very profound and important for where we go in anthropology, where we go in feminist studies, from your collective work, and I'll highlight a few folks of of um, many who who have done this in amazing ways. So I wanna focus on that. Some of the answers that I, that I understood from the work have to do, um, how do we craft a critical epistemological feminist practice around accompaniment and alliances and thinking about the intersections of violence and subjectivity. So I'm gonna start with accompaniment. Um, I'm a linguistic anthropologist and I would argue, I will always argue that language always matters, that we must always attend to language in a, in, in, a, in a deeply profound way because it shapes our very realities in the way that we move. And one of the things that emerges for me in the collective body of work is the idea of accompaniment, right? To accompany, acompañar, that, that this work is to acompañar. And we might gloss that very, um, briefly as to go with, but I think if we turn to the work that you have, have given us and listen carefully, read carefully, uh, engage uh, at that level, there, there's a polysemous understanding of to accompany. And to accompany means much more, I think you have given us. Um, if we look through the text, to accompany means to not only to go with, but to be with to be with in space and time. To accompanier means to listen. It means to witness and to collaborate when asked, <laughs> not uninvited. And, and I think most of all to, uh, then you've given us to accompanier 
means it's it's a process, not an event. That means that there is a, a standing uh, recurrence to engaging over time. And those engagements are necessarily, um, as you have directed us to, they're taxing, they're sometimes taxing, they're sometimes painful, they're sometimes hopeful, and they emerge both in the quotidian moments of life as well as those that are extraordinary. And I think we can find that really in all of the chapters, but I wanna highlight, I would like to highlight a couple here. Uh, the work of uh, Lina Rosa Berrios, who has done incredible work with um, thinking about indigenous Mixteca, women's experience with obstetric violence. Um, and Vanessa Maldonado's work among sex trafficked and women who work as sex workers in the border between um, Guatemala and, and Mexico. Um, and whose work carries that deep sense of acompañar that both is in practice and in theory in their texts. Um, maybe we'll return to that in the end of my comments. And the next place, I think that another place that stands out to me where, where you all have directed us to go and to build upon is the idea of making alliances. Um, and alliances, feminist alliances, of course, are is, it's familiar terrain, I think, for those of us in the audience. But what can we, if that's a given, what can we learn from listening to and accompanying um, processes of making alliances? And there, the chapter by um, Georgina Mendez Torres, I think, is offers an important contribution. And she, uh, in particular, writes as an indigenous woman, as an indigenous woman on the way that Maya women in Guatemala and Mexico, as well as Quicho women in, women in Ecuador, have used um, the technology of writing, and of course, writing in Spanish, in addition to indigenous languages, as tools for collective self-representation and, in fact, alliance building. Um, in particular, she takes us through the nuances of the way that uh, organizations of indigenous women in, um, for example, La Escuela de Formación Mujeres Líderes in Ecuador and uh, Mujeres Mayas Cacla in Guatemala have, have created discursive spaces, political spaces through, um, through the ability to articulate their, their formation, their trajectories, their stances, their analyses of racism, sexuality, uh, empowerment through, through methods that allow them to circulate beyond their own community. So there's some movement we see from the community outward into the region and into, into the nation. And certainly her work shows us um, those possibilities of transnational indigenous organizing that women take up while maintaining their work in their own communities. Um, so alliances, I think, are the second place that a second place that the, the book as a whole takes us um, and points to the, the promise of the future. And the third um, the third place I, a third place that I think the work directs us is to really, always situate in some ways, it obliges us perhaps all of the chapters to situate feminist, feminist anthropological analytic work, epistemological praxis, always with a lens on violence. Violence isn't, we know, right, is an inexca inescapable aspect of patriarchal domination, but that takes many forms. It has many nuances that help us not just say, oh, violence, but, but really to layer in different, different um, vectors of violence, to think about violence as multifaceted uh, from intersectional subjectivities of the folks who, who, um, who experience them. So violent subjectivity, and I think uh, we have to add, or I want to add, I think I would be remiss uh, in commenting on the text if I didn't say 
keeping in mind then that state, state power and agents of the state are necessarily always um, operative when we're talking about fields of inequality. And this I think speaks to the, the work that uh, Marisa has outlined in her chapter when we move from the community study in anthropology, there's an isolated community of indigenous people over there in, you know, in such and such Pueblo or Aldea to really um, thinking about, well, and also showing, I think as someone has commented, the relationship historically of anthropology in lots of parts of the world to nationalist projects that are aimed at exclusions um, homogenizing, erase, erasing difference in all kinds of ways. So Marissa's chapter then I think helps us think about the role of the state, the kinds of um, erasures that lead to violence that anthropology has been implicated in and suggests a feminist approach that enables us to decolonize the discipline and our practices by centering the voices of indigenous, trans, non-binary, um, Afro-descendant subjectivities. Um, and I think we would probably say in, a, in, in as part of our process of accompaniment and creating alliances. Um, and another level, uh, I wanna, thinking about violence in that way, to link back to um, Elina Rosa Berrios work and literally um, showing us how doing a very fine detailed uh, analysis that necessarily I think enra enrages us um, of the way that indigenous Mixteca women experience obstetric violence as not apart from, but as part of the violence enacted upon the bodies of indigenous women through racism, through patriarchal structures, um, and through healthcare writ large, so that obstetric violence becomes an index of a broader system of, of ways that violence gets out, gets worked out uh, on, on women's bodies. And she shows us right, how, for example, the issue of birth control should never be read as birth control is good or birth control is bad but rather to ask more complicated questions about how um, access to or the denial of access to contraception is linked to violence agency and the options um, that women, that indigenous women and other women have access to or don't um, through state medical clinics, for example, right? So there are multiplicity of agents. And uh, Vanessa Maldonado's work carries this question of violent subjectivity and, and agents of the state, I think into another very important and nuanced realm making, and she helps us make the distinction between victims of sex, tra survivors of sex trafficking and individuals who choose to participate um, within a field of social inequality who choose to participate in sex work by listening to and accompanying women who work uh, uh, um, in the commodification of sex, right, in, in Tapachulas, in that, in that space between, between Guatemala and Mexico. Um, and helps us again to understand we need to move beyond the commodification of sex and whether or not we think about that as a form of violence, but really to understand how women who have can 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 have both of those experiences that shift their um, subjectivity, both being victims of of uh, of force, coerced uh, sexual slavery, as well as women who then choose to participate in sex trade as a measure of of, of carving a space out for themselves, both at the same time. Um, so I think um, if I can um, use that as an occasion to, to bring these points together um, is that from my vantage point as an outsider in this project, but as a, as a feminist anthropologist that hopes to continue to accompanyar, accompanyarles, um, you, the book has given us a rich history 
a multiplicity of voices and, and some, some clear uh, but complicated paths forward for how we want to continue to work and think um, and uh, make our alliances inside and outside of the uh, academy. So I'll stop there and thank you all for the chance to join you. Thank you very much, Bridget Jim, for uh, being here and for sharing some concepts as accompanyar from Spanish to English um, and for take this uh, work seriously. Uh, we think that it is important to make circulate knowledge in a radical way. And we observe that there are few studies about genealogies of feminist anthropologies uh, in different contexts, such as the Mexican region. And uh, we also observe that frequently the works of Anglo-Saxon authors have been imported into Latin America context, but in English, for example, speaking magazines, there is almost always a reduced presence of Latin American women as authors, and they are often located in the place of study, uh, of object of study. So I think that it is very um, uh, important for us to have those dialogues and and thank you very much for for your comments uh, now um, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, my my friend and my colleague um, Mary Goldsmith Mary Goldsmith is one of the authors and editors of this book and uh, Mary studied her BA in anthropology at American University and her PhD at the University of Connecticut. Um, born in Baltimore, she has resided in Mexico City since 1976. And Mary is a professor in feminist studies and head of the research unit, Women, Identity and Power at the Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana. And her research has focused on feminist anthropology, domestic work, migration, and political organizing. Mary is an activist a scholar who collaborates with the Latin American and Caribbean Confederation of Domestic Workers and with Montserrat Salas. She is currently um, the coordinator of the Committee of Feminist and Gender Anthropology in the College of Ethnologies and Social Anthropologies. Thank you very much, Mary, for, for being here. Boy, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Marisa. Uh, uh, it is an incredible honor to participate in this uh, forum, but I'm not going to go into all the formalities because I think we have seven minutes left. Right? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I will reduce my three pages to one page. Uh, I, I think it's an incredible opportunity to have a dialogue between Mexican based and US-based feminist anthropologists. We've had uh, several dialogues between, uh, 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 with, with uh, anthropo feminist anthropologists from other Latin American countries. But I think what, uh, and also with uh, feminist anthropologists from, the, the, uh, from Spain. But I think it's interesting to uh, think about the possibilities of also what we have mentioned in the book in terms of North-South discussions among feminist anthropologies. Now in terms of what are the topics, what are the, uh, what is the, uh, that we, uh, the problems, uh, research problems that, that we, are, uh, we are studying and what has been the contribution of feminist anthropology in the distinct um, uh, countries now. I was thinking that I think in IUAES is another space where this has happened. And also, uh, in an odd way, is saying Lhasa. No? Uh, also, I, I wanted to, uh, there's not much time to talk about this, but the entire issue of the politics of, of uh, translation as to who and what is translated, distributed, and also quoted. No? Uh, for example, Henrietta Moore, uh, Shelley Rosaldo, June Nash, Helen Saha. Uh, Francois uh, uh, Eritier uh, have been translated to Spanish and often cited. And the, uh, 
what we often find is that uh, the uh, English speaking anthropologists are translated if they are also Latino Americanistas in terms of what is their, their uh, uh, region of specialization. However, uh, however there are other uh, uh, anthropologists who I think are mar marvelous, for example, Eleanor Leacock, uh, Micaela de Leonardo, uh, Faye Harris, and Lynn Bowles, who unfortunately have not been translated. And they really do bring uh, a perspective in terms of, uh, of uh, critiques of colonialism, of racism, and also they provide uh, Marxist inspired perspectives for the uh, study of uh, gender and other kinds of inequalities. On the other hand, and I, I don't even think I'm going to get managed to get to the art, the two chapters that I am supposed to, to, to discuss. Uh, if we ask who, which anthropologists from Latin America, feminist anthropologists are translated and read in English. Now, I, I also agree with uh, Susan. I celebrate and am very happy that, that uh, for, uh, for uh, the existence of, of Google Translate now. Um, but for example, uh, we find Lourdes has been uh, translated. Um, uh, but, uh, Lourdes, uh, Aida uh, Hernandez certainly have been translated, but there are others who have not, for example, like Pati Castaneda, and I'm not sure if Mercedes uh, Oliveira, who also was my teacher briefly when I first arrived in Mexico. Also, I, I, uh, sat in awe of her and I have to recognize that I did not understand half of what she said because of my limited Spanish at the time, no? But also it's, it's interesting as Lynn Bowles points out is what are the politics uh, of, of citation, no, as well. And I was, because I was looking at our book in terms of, uh, we always bring up Henrietta Moore, but there are other authors who just are, are uh, uh, or uh, do not are not do not form part of the feminist anthropological canon. No, um, uh, let me see. I I I was supposed to talk about uh, Veronica Rodriguez and Natalia de Merini's book uh, chapters. However, I will leave that for another time, uh, uh, so that Montserrat has a chance to uh, also um, talk a bit. Is that okay? Is that okay? Uh, Marisa? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. are, you, are you finishing? Yeah, I, I, I am going to finish because it's 1258. Yes, yes. And yes. we uh, know that I, always, I, that I always talk too much. No, it is okay. Thank you very much, Mary. And I am sorry about the technical problems. And uh, we we worry. still have we still no have Monse. And if we have time at the end, we we can continue having this discussion. But um, uh, is it okay, Nara, if I continue with Monse? We we just have like two minutes, but okay. Okay, so I, I will introduce quickly Montserrat Salas. She is an anthropologist and also a feminist, and she works on nutrition and health with marginalized rural and urban populations. She has worked for 30 years at the National Institute of Medical Sciences and Nutrition, teaching undergraduate and postgraduate courses at UNAM and at one. And she's a great friend, and this is not less important because I think that feminist anthropology is built by those networks of friendships. And I am very glad to <coughs> that you are here, Monse. Thank you very much. Gracias, Marisa. ¿Qué te parece si leo en español y ya tomamos estos minutos? Perfect. Bueno, agradezco sinceramente a mi querida Marisa. Ristrejo, eh, por esta y otras tantas actividades a las que nos ha convocado a compartir. Y sobre todo agradezco al ILAS por hospedar un diálogo tan gratificante como este que tenemos hoy. 
Tomaré estos minutos para esbozar aspectos del largo proceso de elaboración de esta obra colectiva, un libro extenso y diverso, pero sobre todo alimentado con vínculos profesionales y afectivos, muy necesarios de evidenciar. Como se señala en la introducción, el libro tiene sus antecedentes directos en el cuarto congreso de 2016 del Colegio de Etnólogos y Antropólogos Sociales de México, una de las agrupaciones gremiales más consolidadas de nuestro país. Para elaborar esa propuesta, nos reunimos un pequeño grupo de colegas, unidas por relaciones previas en vías intercomunicadas, bajo la cálida y significativa convocatoria de Patricia Castañeda y de Mary Goldsmith, aquí presente. Ambas consideraron acertadamente que el Congreso sería un espacio idóneo para dar continuidad a los lazos académicos locales y regionales y sobre todo para visibilizar la presencia de la antropología feminista en México. Así, organizamos cuatro simposios, los cuales reunieron a colegas de varias instituciones y generaciones estudiosas de múltiples temáticas, poblaciones y con distintas pre preguntas de investigación. Los aportes y discusiones durante el Congreso fueron muy fructíferas, abrieron tantos campio, campos de reflexión que por eso la idea del libro. Invitamos a participantes a convertir sus ponencias en capítulos publicables del libro, pero por razones diversas, algunas declinaron la invitación. Pero la mayoría de los capítulos se derivan de los trabajos de ese Congreso. Además, para ampliar aún más el panorama diverso de las antropologías feministas en México, invitamos a otras colegas a escribir sus reflexiones y experiencias para incluirlas en la obra completa. Cada uno de los capítulos fue dictaminado por pares y la obra completa también. Así, en las páginas de este libro se encuentra la presencia de alrededor de 50 mujeres profesionales de la antropología y el feminismo entre autoras y dictaminadoras. La coordinación de tan tremenda tarea nos acercó como grupo tanto en lo profesional como en la práctica colaborativa del quehacer feminista. Nos reunimos infinidad de veces en la cafetería de la editorial Fondo de Cultura Económica en el sur de la Ciudad de México. Por lo cual, jugando con el humor, comenzamos a autodenominarnos las del fondo, en un doble juego de interpretación discursiva tanto por reunirnos en ese lugar como porque desde las profundidades de nuestra disciplina antropológica fuimos emergiendo con una obra colectiva que hoy se encuentra disponible para ser leída, comentada y criticada. Y está representado en la portada del libro, ya que son semillas que germinan desde el fondo de la tierra. Como señalé, la idea del libro se empezó a gestar en 2017, pero el último tramo del camino se realizó durante los prolongados meses del confinamiento debido a la pandemia. El largo y meticuloso proceso de revisión y producción nos obligó a poner lo mejor de nuestros esfuerzos en las idas y venidas de los mensajes entre autoras y dictaminadoras, para corregir y complementar sus manuscritos hasta que los textos se encontraron en su mejor versión. Cuidamos los contenidos, pero también dedicamos un esfuerzo extraordinario para que el proceso de revisión editorial diera como resultado una obra cuidada en cada uno de sus detalles formales. Me detengo un momento para referirme a la sección 4 del libro, denominada La antropología y el feminismo, narraciones en primera persona sobre experiencias 
de investigación y docencia, ya que en ella se reúnen trabajos que presentan experiencias en investigación, en docencia y en la vida misma. Si bien muchos de los capítulos de todo el libro dan cuenta de etnografías situadas, justamente en esta sección se encarna esta propuesta metodológica. Las autoras, Sara Elena Pérez Gil, Gilda Salazar, Adriana García Mesa, Mestli Joali Rodríguez y yo misma, eh, ofrecimos diálogos múltiples entre la antropología y el quehacer feminista. Generamos narrativas personales, etnografías reflexivas y dejamos en la mesa un producto que da cuenta de procesos individuales y colectivos. Considero de gran valía que se haya incorporado una sección como esta en nuestro libro, ya que escribir desde el sentipensar constituye un aporte legítimo al conocimiento social con interpretaciones antropológicas de nuestras trayectorias, trayectorias vitales. Observo ahora el libro como objeto y como contenido y siento un gran regocijo. Pero me hago nuevas preguntas. Por ejemplo, ¿cómo analizar desde la antropología feminista el tránsito social desde el 8M 2020 que llenó las calles de muchas ciudades del país al 8M 2021 conmemorado en pandemia o del próximo 8M 2022? ¿Qué intercambios hemos generado a nivel local y regional con nuestras colegas, favorecido el quehacer antropológico por las redes sociales y sociodigitales? En fin, termino esta breve reflexión señalando que no estábamos equivocadas cuando propusimos en aquel lejano Comase, el Congreso, un simposio dedicado específicamente a favorecer diálogos, intergener, gina, perdón, diálogos intergeneracionales, ya que hoy, quizás como nunca antes, las nuevas generaciones de feministas antropólogas, antropólogas feministas, están posicionando nuevos temas de investigación y reflexión antropológica, nuevos acercamientos metodológicos colaborativos y nuevas sujetas y sujetos con nuevas formas de sentipensar nuestras preguntas de investigación. Pero tal vez no son completamente nuevas, como vimos en esta hermosa reunión, pues forman parte del flujo constante del conocimiento recuperado en las genealogías del saber y del hacer tan propias de nuestra disciplina. Aprendizajes y respetos mutuos es lo que necesitamos. Este pluralismo generacional también está contenido en la obra que hoy comentamos y que, por supuesto, invito a leer. Gracias, Marisa, por la traducción. Uh, thank you, Monse. Uh, actually, we won't have time to read the translation of your text but I put the text in English in the chat of Zoom. And uh, I would like to say that while the event was originally scheduled to end at two, um, and those who need to should sign off, uh, we will go still 2.15 for conversation for those who are able since we uh, feel a bit behind. And I would like to mention very quickly just uh, some names that uh, we didn't uh, mention before. For example, uh, this book um, has uh, chapters of Mary Goldsmith, Veronica Rodriguez, Laura Valladares, Carmen Cariño, Nadia Rosso, Natalia de Marinis, Cristina Oemichen, and Vanessa um, Maldonado and Natalia de Marinis. And um, we are coming to the end of this event, but we would like to be sure that the audience has the opportunity to make comments or ask questions for the speakers. 
and we have enough of time for a couple of questions. So please, uh, if you want to make a question, please unmute uh, yourself and introduce yourself and let us know how you would like to address your question. There is someone that wants to participate. No te escuchas, Marisa. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. That um, I was saying that someone asked that um, if the event will be posted, and Nara said that um, it will be on the Seneca website at the Center for Mexico and Central America. And uh, I would like to to tell you that you can feel free of uh, ask questions in English or in Spanish. No, I, I feel very proud because we have in the audience Mercedes Olivera, Faye Harrison, Pamela Calla, Luis Lanfer is here. So thank you very much for being here. Um, Gina J, yeah, Mary, you have Something to say, yeah. So I'll make a comment. Yeah, I'll make it. Let me get my hello. Hold on a sec. I just want wanted to. Uh, hi, hi, Louise. Uh, hi. I just wanted to ask uh, Marisa if uh, we have sent the link so that people who uh, can read the book. No, no, but uh, yeah. Actually, I was going to, to say that at the end that you, I, okay. can, find, you can find the, the book online for free. Huh? And, mm -hmm. But also if you, can, uh, if you want to get a copy of the book, there are different libraries and, and bookstores in Mexico where you can um, find them. Uh, and I am not sure, but Luis Lanfer wanted to say something. Yeah, I just want to, I just want to compliment you all on how how interesting and important a lot of your collaborative work is and how how much that shows in various of the of the articles uh collaboration with um quote subjects what we people you know people who are now our people that we accompany um uh, and uh and also the ngos and, and other organizations so i i think it's a great um panoply of of, of articles about the variability, but also this cutting edge piece of what I think is anthropology in the United States as well, the collaborative nature of the way we've, we, we're, we're producing ethnography and, and, and ideas about violence and power. And all, those themes come out so much in so many of the papers. So I just think it's a terrific collection. Thank you very much, Liz. This is a great pleasure to, to have you here. Um, Mary is sharing the, the the link, and I don't know if there is another person that want to answer it or, yeah. I just wanted to say that this, Amen. yes. I just wanted to say that um, I've been working with Marisa for the longest time, and we've been building something we've been calling feminist constellations. Mm -hmm. And uh, unlike many of us, uh, she's been able to constellate so wonderfully with so many genealogies of thought, feminist thought here, there, Central America. So I just want to say that, highlight that. And this allows me to say that um, with Marisa and all the people that ha had started this thinking of feminist constellations, it is now that we can, um, with this kind of events, with this kind of uh, dialogues, we can say that we are affirming our multiple feminisms throughout Latin America, throughout the Americas. So thank you, Marisa, and thank you, 
everybody who's who's here. The comments uh, from Suzanne and Brigitte were so interesting and, and wonderful and everybody else's contributions were like, yeah, I was taking notes all, all, the, all along. So thank you all. Thank you, Pamela. I don't know if Faye, did you? Yeah, that Faye said something. Yeah. Hello. Thank you so much for this encuentro. I mean, this is a very powerful meeting um, and I'm very pleased to be here. I'd like to thank Mary Goldsmith, whom I think I met in 1993, the first time within the context of what was then the ICAES, which was in Mexico City, and the rest is history. I was pleased to see you, Mary, and to meet Marisa and others in Salvador in 2018 at a symposium, which was a post IUAS Congress uh, that focuses, focused on feminists and other women in the history or the histories of anthropologies. Um, thank you for raising the question of the spaces where we could have these various South to South and South to North, I would say East and West conversations amongst us. That's tremendously important. And, and I'd like you to clarify a bit because you said, and I wrote notes. Thank you. You said the IUES has been a space and you said LASA, you sort of hmm, had made a statement that deserves to be qualified. Although I would say, depending on the leadership and it seems the last success, successive uh, administrations have been more devoted to decentering Northern foreign policy centered Latin America studies and area studies. And so I am just delighted the extent to which the leadership has diversified that Afro-descendant scholar activists have been resuscitated, those who died prematurely like Lela Gonzalez and others. And, and we're finding out who our colleagues are in throughout the Americas so that even North Americans can say, well, we need to take the Latin out, qualify it, it's a colonial category. So we all can say this is Nuestra America. Um, but that means we have to take an um, anti-imperial uh, approach and be able to situate, you know, um, American and other North Atlantic anthropologies and feminist anthropologies within that very fraught history. It's important what Suzanne said that we have the power collectively more so than individually to define, and I always put in parentheses to redefine and then redefine again, what is anthropology? And I would say that the decolonial and decolonizing project has been attempting to do that for probably 50 years. And I've been involved 30 years and, and we continue. Um, but the IUES as a former president <laughs> that helped to form the new organization, World Anthropological Union, in which the IUAS and the World Council of Anthropological Associations are chambers that work together. Uh, I think this is a context that is more conscious than ever mm -hmm. of making Southern voices audible, legible. Yeah, right. and helping Northern anthropologists, and that also includes Northern Asian anthropologists like Japanese anthropologists who are not the same thing as anthropologists in the Philippines and Cambodia and Vietnam. All right, so the North is really more than the North Atlantic, but of course the North Atlantic has been the, the seat of epistemological, structural and institutional power in knowledge production. And to the extent that co-production 
yeah, collaboration right. exists. There's so many constraints that reproduce the logics of verticality. Right. Uh, yeah. that, so right. we have to be very vigilant about appropriating the language of decoloniality when the actual material moorings for making that paradigm shift do not obtain. All right, so to be reflexive, so critical, but the point I'm leading to, because I don't want to say too much more, I want to hear what others have to say, is now under WOW, there is a new commission of global feminisms and queer politics that are Brazilian. Um, colleagues took the lead in forming and, and actually transcending the transcending the limits of the older Commission on the Anthropology of Women, which I chaired for 16 years because I couldn't get anybody, we couldn't get anybody else to assume the responsibility to keep it afloat and to develop it in more consistent uh, feminist lines. I think much of what we did was feminist anthropology, but there were members who did not feel comfortable in calling themselves and their work feminists. So we used the old anthropology of women, which when it was founded, what, in 1975, that's, that was the moment where we were um, in what is now feminist anthropology. But that's this good. commission, which is newly constituted, which is expressively and explicitly feminist and is global feminist, recognizing the important advances that queer studies and politics have made to build upon, but go beyond even um, the limits of feminist scholar activism. I think that's a space that that feminist anthropologists beyond the present leadership, you have to, we have to own it and make it realize the promises that have been made about why it was formed. Yeah. So that's an announcement, you know, of a <laughs> new commission that I think has really tremendous possibilities under a new moment. Uh, and regime within basically the world anthropological uh, union. We have to make sure that that union is feminist, queered, you know. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of possibility. And so I commend you all, and I look forward to reading more of the book that I've been able to browse through. Thank you very much, uh, Faye. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we need to finish. And I, I think that we have reached the end and we want to thank everyone for their participation. This seems like a great comment uh, on which to end. And I would like to remind that next week uh, we have the presentation of another book. And I would like to, to share with you quickly that on the 18th, uh, on February 18, we will have um, this presentation at uh, at ILAS and at uh, CLAX uh, at New York University, and that will be at 6 p.m. and we will have uh, more discussions about decolonize and depatriarchalize the social sciences, um, memory and life in different parts of Latin America. And we will have wonderful uh, authors of this book and 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 speakers that will participate. So I I I would like to invite you to be there. Thank you very much for being here and and thank you all for for organizing this activity.